Well, good evening, Northgate family. So glad that you could be with us tonight. We're excited to uh, finish up the chapter 9 of Romans. And um, just Romans is such a, such a great book. We learn so much from it. And, uh, but tonight we're going to be talking about the Creator's plan through most of, most of the rest of this chapter. <clears throat> and we find Paul trying to explain things to the Roman church and to the, to the, uh, <clears throat> to the Jews who have become believers and, uh, and to those who have not yet become believers. And he's, he's explaining in this letter to them about, a, about our creative God who had a creative plan for his people. <clears throat> so we want to start at verse 19, and we're going to read through uh, 26 at this point, then we'll finish up the rest of the chapter in, ju- in just a moment. So for starting with verse 19, well, let me back up a little bit. Um, we, last week we talked about uh, the fact that there were people who were saying that God was, God was not a fair God. Uh, and, uh, and Paul says, are we saying then that God's unfair? Of course not. Uh, for, for God said to Moses, and this is in verse 14, I will show mercy on anyone that I choose and I will show compassion to anyone I choose. And so this is kind of the dialogue that, that Paul is having, uh, with the, with his letter to the Roman church. But starting with verse 19, and we'll read it, like I say, through uh, verse 26. Well, then you might say, why does God blame people for not responding? Haven't they simply done what makes what he makes them to do? Uh, So, you know, in a sense here, we're looking at Paul. He's imagining a person that is complaining about God. Uh, That person argues that God... Uh, should not blame people. And uh, Paul's going to show that an opinion like that is completely wrong. So I want to, I want to continue. I I just wanted to give you that insight at first. Do not say, uh, who, who are you? A a mere human being. Uh, Don't say that. Don't say that. He says, who are you? A mere human being to argue with God. Should the should the thing that was created say to the one who created it, why have you made me like this? When a potter makes jars out of clay, doesn't he have the right to use the same lump of clay to make one jar for decoration and another one to throw in the garbage in, throw the garbage into? In the same way, even though God has the right to show his anger and his power, he is very patient with those on whom his anger falls, who are destined, uh, who are destined for destruction. He does not, uh, I'm sorry, he does this to make the riches of his glory shine even brighter on those to whom he shows mercy, uh, who, who were prepared in advance for his glory. And we are among those whom he has selected, both from the Jews and the Gentiles. Concerning the Gentiles, God says in, 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 in the prophecy of Hosea, so now he's referring to the prophet Hosea. Those who are not my people, I will now call. I will now call my people, and I will love those whom I did not love before. And then at the place where they were told, uh, you and and then at that place where you were told uh, you were not my people, they will still be called children of the living God. So. Like I said, Paul is sort of, he's either imagining that he's, that he's talking, to, talking to somebody who has this opinion about God, uh, he's, that they argue, about, they argue that God should not be blaming people, or this is a real person that he's having uh, uh, a conversation with. It doesn't really tell us, but it feels as though God, that, that Paul is using this as an example. In other words, he might be saying, suppose a person is complaining about God. So he may be using uh, that terminology. <clears throat> In verse 20, he reminds, he reminds people that God is the creator. It is God who is the creator. And people, li- people live and they exist because it was God who created them. Now, it'd be rare, it, Paul is saying it'd be very wrong for a person to accuse 
his creator. Like, who are we to say to God, you can't do that? Why do, or why did you make me like this? You know, why am I so tall? Why am I so short? Why am I so big? Why am I so thin? You know, or, or I don't like my face and, 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 all, and all of this. Uh, we cannot say to God, uh, that would be wrong. We cannot say to God, why did you do this? Uh, Paul is talking about people uh, who don't want to obey God. This is who he's talking about here. They always want to find an excuse to oppose God and to oppose his authority. Well, I find people like that all the time, people that have so many questions about God, but they're asking those questions because really deep down inside, they don't want to obey God. They don't want to, they don't want to become subservient to, to a creative God. And so in, in, uh, in, in, with people like this, uh, you know, it's, Paul is saying to them, who are you to say that God can and can't do that? He can't show his mercy or, or, or he, he has no right to make us this way. Who are you to say that? So in verse 21, Paul uses, a, is, uses an example of a potter. Isaiah, in Isaiah 26, 29, 16 Isaiah said, a clay pot cannot pretend that the potter has no skill. This, was, this is from the prophet Isaiah. The truth is, the pot itself is evidence of the potter's skill. The pot itself, whatever kind of, whatever kind of uh, uh, pottery the, the, the potter used uh, to, to make his design. It could be a beautiful vase that held beautiful flowers, or it could be a bucket that holds trash. You know, it, it, whatever it is, it's, it was up to the creator who made that. And so Paul is saying here that the potter has a right to make different kind of pots. Now, some pots, as I said, might be beautiful and some are just kind of ordinary. Uh, therefore, God also has the right to deal with people the way he chooses. We're talking about God. We have no right to say, God, you're, you're, you're so unfair. Why are, those people, why are those people being treated like that? Well, there's a reason. God, God knows everything. He's, all, he's omniscient. He, he's all-knowing. And um, so he has a right to deal with people as he chooses. And he doesn't owe anyone an explanation. We need to get that in our spirit. God will, God will treat people the way he chooses and he doesn't owe anybody an explanation. And I know that, I know we don't like thinking like that. I know that bothers us to think that way, that, that God would be that way. But God has a right to act and be and choose whatever he desires. Uh, that's why we should respect God. We should respect his decisions because uh, his decisions are always right. His judgments are always perfect. God's judgments are always perfect. Uh, you know, God, God sees behind the veil. He sees around the corner. He sees what we cannot see. And he moves and does things in a way that for us is beneficial to us. Because if we knew what was around the corner, boy, we may not be able to handle it. But God knows. And so uh, that's, that's the kind of creative God that we serve. In verses 22 and 23, we talked about Paul, as he said, that God has the right to show his anger and to show his power. Uh, but he has been very, very patient with those who have opposed him. Uh, he has delayed his time of judgment uh, as he has given more and more time for people to repent of their sins. That's why I love the scripture in 2 Peter 3, 9. I wrote it down here. It says, the Lord isn't being slow about his promises, as some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. He doesn't want anyone to be destroyed. And some of your translations may say he doesn't want anyone to perish, but wants everyone to repent. So God is just waiting people waiting for people to repent. And I think that's some of the problem when people say, oh, God's unfair, God is not just, you know, they, they don't want to first repent of their sins and recognize that God is all-knowing and that God does everything just right. His judgments are perfect. God's judgments are perfect. But the problem is people don't want to uh, 
I, as I said before, be subservient to uh, a holy God. And so, and that is why they continued to, that is why some of these people continued to do wicked things. They're preparing themselves, Paul says here in Romans, they're preparing themselves for God's judgment. So it's, it's God is waiting for people uh, to repent of their sins. But for those who have received his mercy, here's Paul saying to them, God is preparing them to receive his glory. And we're talking about eventual heaven someday or living in the kingdom of God while we're here on earth, the glory of God. Um, in verses 24 and 25, Paul includes himself with the Jews who have received God's mercy. It's like Paul saying, I'm showing you the difference here. You know, you can either reject the things of God because you don't want to, you don't want to serve him. You don't want to submit your life to him. Or you can be people who have received God's mercy. And, uh, but he also says that the Gentiles, and so now he's speaking to the Jew, Jews here, the Gentiles have become God's children also. That was difficult for some of the Jewish people to realize. And we'll get to that in just a moment. Paul uses words here from the prophet Hosea. He mentions the prophet Hosea. Now, Hosea uh, had a wife who was not loyal to him. And um, Hosea had a suspicion that he was not the father of his second or third child. So um, he named the second child Lo Ruhama, which, which meant uh, Hosea felt that he was un unable to love that child. And uh, the third child that he wasn't sure about, he named him uh, Lo Ami, which means not my people. And so this prophecy was, 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 yes, about Hosea and his family and his situation, but it was also a prophecy that God was using to, 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 speak, to, the, to speak to the Israelites that they, um, they, they are not becoming his people anymore because of their disobedience. So God used this situation with the prophet Hosea. These children, they were signs that Israel was not loyal to God. Okay, so, but in the future, God says, God would be able to call Israel my people. And so that's the whole idea of this prophecy that Paul is reminding the Romans that took place in the life of uh, Hosea. At that time, uh, God would show real love to them, to Israel. There, in other words, what he's saying there is there's coming a time as the people repent uh, God would once again show his love to Israel. Uh, Paul, Paul uses uh, uh, Hosea's words as a prophecy here. And the Gentiles would also become people who, who God would love. And Paul could see that this was starting to happen. He could see it. In verses 27 and 29, uh, we talked, let, let's read that verse 27, 29. I know we read it once, but, uh, oh, I guess we haven't read that. We haven't gone that far yet. Here's verse 27, 29. And concerning Israel, Isaiah, the prophet cried out, though the people of Israel are numerous as the sands of the seashore, only a remnant will be saved for the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth quickly and with finality. And Isaiah and Isaiah said the same thing in another place. He said this, if the, Lord, if the Lord of heaven's armies had not prepared a few of our children, uh, uh, we would have been wiped out like Sodom destroyed and like Gomorrah being destroyed. So God has promised many wonderful things, as we know, in the word of God. And he promised many things Wonderful things to the people of Israel, the Jews. He said that he would do things that he promised to do with them. Isaiah 10.20, um, if we can go there, Isaiah 10.20. Um, sorry, I thought I had it marked here.
I'm getting there. Isaiah. Isaiah 10, 20. In that day, the judgment left in Israel, the survivors in the house of Jacob will no longer depend on allies who, who seek to destroy them, but they will faithfully trust the Lord. See, he sees, Isaiah sees the people coming back to God. They will faithfully trust the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. A remnant will return. Yes, a remnant of Jacob will return to, the, to, mighty, to Almighty God. So, um, Isaiah wrote at a time uh, when the army from Assyria was attacking Judah. So what we just read, that was during a time when uh, an Assyrian army was attacking Judah, the southern kingdom of Israel. Remember when God promised to Abraham, he said that the descendants would be many. They would be like the sands of the sea. You wouldn't be able to count them. And that was a promise that God gave to Israel. But now Israel had rebelled against God. Israel was being captured by the Assyrians. And, uh, it, and, and sooner or later, Israel would come under God's judgment of being people who didn't look like they had much to go on. But because of sin, God was using the Assyrian army and the Assyrian people to punish Israel. So only a few of them, as, as Isaiah said, only a few of them would remain. In other words, only a few of them would make it out. But God would save a remnant, a few, more, a few people. In verse 29, Paul refers to the ancient cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And we've heard about Sodom and Gomorrah before. And that there's, their cities were totally destroyed. Nothing remained. There wasn't a remnant left of those people. So the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, they had no descendants. They had no promise from, from God that, that their numbers would be like the sands of the sea. But the Israelis, they did. They did. It was sudden and it was final as far as Sodom and Gomorrah was concerned. But God didn't deal that way with the Israelites. And, the, and in the same way, God still had a plan for the Israelites. That's why as we look at, as we look at what's happening right now uh, with Israel and their war against Hamas, um, we, see, we see that Israel will win. Israel will win. They have, uh, they have the promise of God still with them. And uh, God still has a plan for the Israelites. Um, you know, their, their punishment uh, would not be as, as it was with Sodom and Gomorrah, a total and final. He would allow them to have and continue to have descendants. Isaiah said in Isaiah 7, 3, that those who remain will return. Um, there's a song we sing that they will return with singing unto Zion. And uh, for Paul, Isaiah's words were a prophecy that many, many uh, Jews, uh, the prophecy was that there's many Jews that just will not trust God. And only a few would accept his son and avoid punishment. So now we're getting into the New Testament era where, where Paul is talking about Jesus being the Messiah. Jesus being, Jesus being the Savior, that, and he was God's son. And there would be a, only a few that would begin to accept his son, and they would avoid punishment. Okay, These few would return to God, and they would obey him. And by them, God would carry out his promise to save the Jews. Verses 30 through 33, let's go there. What does all this mean? Even though the Gentiles were not trying to follow God's standards, they were made right with God. And it was by faith that this took place. <clears throat> but the people of Israel, who tried so hard to get right with God by keeping the law, they never succeeded. Why not? Because they were trying to get right with God by keeping the law instead of by trusting Him. That, so they, they stumbled over the great rock 
in, in, in that was in their path. God warned them of the scriptures when he said, I am placing a stone in Jerusalem that makes people stumble, a rock that makes them fall. Anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Jesus is the stone. He's the cornerstone and he is the stone that, that people seem to stumble over all the time. Paul, Paul here in, in uh, verses 30 through 33, he was somewhat contrasting the Jews and the Gentiles. He said that the Gentiles, they were not looking for a way to have a right relationship with God. But when they discovered the gospel, when they discovered that Jesus is and was the Messiah when he was there, that they just, they just needed to accept him by faith. They discovered that uh, where most Jews thought that they had to earn their way to heaven. And so this is what Paul's saying. It's not the way, it's not by doing good deeds. It's not by earning your way to heaven. It's not by keeping all the laws, the rules, the traditions. It's by faith in Jesus Christ. So they tried to obey the law, the Jews did, and they thought that God would accept them because they were doing good works. But because they could never be perfect, they could never receive right relationship with God. Isn't it great that God said, tells us in his word to come to him just like we are? Repent of our sins, accept Jesus Christ as the Savior and Lord of the Lord of the, of the earth and, uh, and of the world and and, uh, and, and all that comes by faith in Jesus Christ. We accept him by faith. For by grace are we saved through faith, and yet not of ourselves, but it's a, it's a gift of God. The Jews were trying to earn their way to God. They were trying to earn their way to heaven. And, and Paul goes on to say here in, in the last verse here, in verse 33, that anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. You'll never be disappointed in following after Jesus. Jesus has become, for many, a stumbling stone. Uh, you ever talk to people and they're, they're trying to figure out ways to navigate their way through life, and so you bring up the name of Jesus and how Jesus can help them, and it's like a stumbling stone for them. They're not ready to accept it because they're not ready to accept him, and he becomes a stumbling stone. The, the other stone that the Bible talks about is that Jesus is the cornerstone. He's the corner, cornerstone of our, of our faith, and so... So that's where we're at in chapter 19, or chapter 9, I should say. And next week, we'll dive into chapter 10. Uh, hope you all have a great week. But before we go tonight, I, I, I want to pray for John Laswell. He had surgery today, and uh, he had, I believe, two or three stents put in, and they repaired some of the valves uh, uh, could, because a couple weeks ago, he had a heart attack. So... Uh, he's in a lot of pain. I just talked to someone in the family for, uh, that's, that was at the hospital. He's in a lot of pain. So we just need to pray for him tonight and pray that the, the power of the Holy Spirit would just hover over him and be with him uh, tonight. Father, I just pray in Jesus' name that you'd be with John, that you would continue to bring healing to his body. We thank you for um, doctors and those who worked with him, who made some, obviously, some right decisions for him. And so we thank you for that, Lord. But Lord, would you just bring healing to his body now? I know he loves you. I know he trusts you, oh God. And today we just say, Lord, uh, be his comfort, be his strength, and uh, be with Sandy and the rest of the family. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, God bless you. Hope to see you next week, uh, this Sunday rather, and uh, tune in again next Wednesday. Thanks. Bye.